All right, prayer. All earthly things with earth will fade away, but prayer grasps eternity. But I'm convinced of this, God does not hear prayer. He hears desperate prayer. Prayer is not a position, what do you need? Prayer is not a position, it's a disposition. You get to the place where you'd rather sweat, you'd rather weep in his presence than laugh in anybody else's presence. You'd rather God whisper a speaking into your heart that breaks you. Than somebody give you the prizes that all the world covets. Prayer is almost the greatest human privilege that we have. How many believe that? Amen. Now here's, whoa, whoa. Does your prayer life show it? That's a different ball game. It is. God hears prayer. Say that out loud. God hears, prayer. God hears prayer. How many of you are ready to worship today? How many of you are ready to hear the word of God today? Amen. All right, now before you do that, you know, you never know what you're asked to do up here. I never thought in my whole ministry I'd be asked to bring a bunch of peeps up here. But these are for you. When you leave today, we're asking you to pick up at least one, if not more. Give them to someone that's unchurched, someone that's not a believer, a neighbor, a friend, a relative, and invite them to come Easter Sunday, okay? So I'm asking you, everybody, to take at least one and do it. It's kind of a cute thing, and it's neat, but we want people to come. And so, by the way, if you brought your book today, we're in page six. And as you're turning, um, one of the hardest things for a pastor to do, to be honest, and we ought to do it more, is to be transparent. So today, I'm going to be super transparent. Um, I'm going to admit a weakness that I have struggled with all of my Christian life from the time I got saved, even up till this moment. Now there's a lot of things I don't struggle with. You know, the number one fear have always, has always been, it's been said, speaking in public. I mean, I don't mean this to be uh, condescending, but there's some of you up here, you'd be like this if you were speaking to this group. That's never bothered me. I don't, I've, I've spoken to 25,000 people at a time. That, I have no problem speaking to, to crowds. Matter of fact, any preacher worth their salt will tell you the bigger the crowd, the better he likes it, if he's really worth his salt. And so I got no problem doing that. I have no problem sharing the gospel one-on-one. -on -one. Doesn't matter to me if they're skeptics or cynics or critics, soft as clay, hard as rocks. If, people, if they'll listen, I'll share the gospel. As a matter of fact, I want you to um, I'm going to give you a fake name, but God knows who it is. I want you to remember Sarah. That's not her real name. But Sarah is a cart girl at a golf course where I play. And for about two months, I've been working on Sarah. She's, a sweet, she's one of the sweetest people I've ever met in my life. As a matter of fact, she's so sweet, I, I, you didn't, I didn't, had not really got a chance to talk to her much because usually we're pretty busy playing golf. But some days are not as busy as others. And so I finally got to talk to her, and I just assumed she was a believer. She is not a believer. She has no spiritual background at all. And I've been trying to get her just to read the Gospel of John. She promised me she would, then I'd see her and she'd drop her head. I hadn't done it, hadn't done it, hadn't done it. So this past week I was playing, in fact, I was playing some of you know David Pollock. I was playing with David's a good friend of mine. So we were playing golf. And here comes Sarah around the guy. So she saw me, she drops her head. I, I haven't done it, haven't done it. I said, I told you integrity's doing what you say you'll do. You told me you'd do it. I, she says, okay, I promise you, I'll start tonight. So I got an email from her when I said, I want you to email me. So I got an email that night. And she said, I started the first chapter. Got an email from her yesterday. I've read five chapters. I told her, read the Gospel of John, ask two questions. Who did Jesus claim to be? What am I going to do about it? So I want you to pray for Sarah. I just want, sometime today, even now, but later, just ask God to use the Word of God to bring Sarah to Christ. Because I do believe in that. I got no problem sharing the Gospel. I love it. I love getting into my study and, and, and spending hours. And I do spend hours preparing messages, getting sermons from the Lord. I'm the one that gets blessed and, and learn more about God's word. Okay, all that, none of that's a problem. Prayer, that's hard work for me. I don't think I've ever mastered it. I don't think I ever will. I've never felt I was great at it. As a matter of fact, I feel like when it comes to the school of prayer, to be very honest with you, I'm still in the first grade. So if any of you can relate to that today, now you may be like, you know, Martin Luther, it was said, got up every morning at four o'clock and prayed for two hours. 
Now, the only reason I don't get up at four o'clock is because I don't even think God is up at four o'clock. But Martin Luther got up at four o'clock and prayed for two hours. And I'm not, I, I'm not say you have to do that at all, but we're going to talk about that in a moment. But if you're like me and you say, man, pastor, I can relate to that. Then what we're going to do over the next several weeks, we're going to go to class together. Now, I just want to encourage you. You don't want to miss this class. If you're watching online, you do not want to miss these series, not because of the teacher, because I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about Jesus, who is not only the greatest expert on prayer ever lived, he's the very one we pray to. So let me tell you why you ought to be excited over the next several weeks. I want you to imagine that you have a daughter or a son and they play basketball. How would you like it if Michael Jordan said to you, I will personally coach your child? You'd be pumped. Or for example, what if um, you're a golfer? And Tiger Woods voluntarily said, hey, I'll teach you how to play golf. You couldn't wait. Or imagine if uh, Gordon Ramsay were to say to you, I'm going to become your personal instructor on how to cook. Well, you'd be on the edge of your seat. You'd be ready to hear, man, I, I'm all ears. I'm all in. Whatever you want to say, I'm going to take notes. I'm going to write it down. Well, how much more ready and eager should we be to hear about Jesus talk about prayer? Because nobody knew how to pray like Jesus. As a matter of fact, of all the things that made the disciples snap their head and turn around, even more than the miracles, even more than walking on the water and feeding the 5,000, the first time they heard Jesus pray, they went to Jesus and said, teach us how to do that. We've never heard anybody pray like you pray. We don't know how to pray like that. Well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to hear from Jesus. So we're going to be taking three classes today. We're going back to school. We're going to have prayer 101 today, prayer 201 the next time, and then on the third message, it's going to be prayer 301. Now, if you're a guest of ours today or watching for the first time, we're in a series on the Sermon on the Mount that we're calling Get Used to Different. And even the religious experts in that day, I'm talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the PhDs and the, and the seminary professors, who thought they knew all about how to pray. Even they were stunned when they heard Jesus pray. They were shocked at how different that it was. True story. There was a PhD student at Princeton University. He walked into the office of Albert Einstein, true story, and he asked him a great question. He said, Dr. Einstein, what is there left in the world for original dissertation research? He wanted to get his PhD. He said, what is left in the world for original dissertation research? You will never believe what Dr. Einstein said. He said, that's easy. Find everything out you can about prayer. Somebody got to find out about prayer. So today we're going to do a deep dive into prayer. Now, before we get into it, if you're taking notes, and even if you're not, you might want to jot down three things I'm going to share with you about prayer that will really help us learn how to pray, and it will move you to pray. So just three things you might want to jot down real quickly. First of all, God requires prayer. God doesn't ask us to pray. He doesn't beg us to pray. He doesn't hope we'll pray. He doesn't suggest we'll pray. God commands us to pray. If you don't pray, you're living in sin. God requires prayer. But it gets better. God receives prayer. God hears prayer. Greatest thought I've ever had about God. God hears prayer. With all that's going on in this world and all the things God could be concerned about, every time I simply look up and say two words, Heavenly Father, he stops everything he's doing. He gives me his full undivided attention. He receives prayer. His prayer light is always on. And then here's the third thing to remember. God rewards prayer. God does answer prayer. As a matter of fact, as we begin prayer 101 today, you're gonna to be surprised to learn, and this is really shocking when you think about it, so if you go to Jesus and you say, Lord, I want you to teach me to pray. This is amazing what he does. Before Jesus tells the disciples and us what to pray, before he tells the disciples how to pray, he says, before we do that, we got to go to prayer 101. You're not ready for prayer 201. You're not ready for prayer 301 till you pass prayer 101. And here's what you're going to learn in prayer 101. You're going to learn two things. 
where should I pray and why should I pray? Where should I pray and why should I pray? Now, let me just be clear about something when, you, when we study the prayer that we're gonna start study, begin to study today. Jesus was not just talking about doing something we all do. He wasn't talking about saying a prayer. He was talking about praying a prayer. I love to surprise people, I do it a lot. You can imagine being a pastor, people will come up to me and they'll, give me, they'll tell me a situation they're going through or something, and they'll say that, something like this, pastor, would you, would you just say a prayer for me? And it always shocks them when I say, no, I won't do that. Say what? No, I won't do that. I, I guess you didn't hear me. I'm asking you to say a prayer for me. I, no, you didn't, you heard me. I'm not going to do that. You won't? Here's what I tell them. I will pray a prayer for you. I won't say a prayer for you. Because there's a big difference between saying a prayer and praying a prayer. When you just say a prayer, you're just talking out loud. But when you pray a prayer, you're talking to God. So here's what we're going to learn in prayer 101 and 201 and 301, and it is really going to surprise you. Here's what I want you to listen to and learn. Prayer is not to get what we want from God. It is to get what God wants for us. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Prayer is not to get what we want. That's why a lot of you get disappointed when you pray. I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, you know, I prayed about something and God didn't answer my prayer. And you know what I love to say? Yes, he did. He said, no. <laughs> no is an answer. God always answers prayer. We'll talk about that later. God always answers prayer. But prayer is not primarily to get what we want from God. It is to get what God wants for us. Now, in order to get to the heart of prayer, you've got to pray with the right heart. So let's just dive in. Let's see what Jesus wants to teach us in prayer 101. All right? Here's lesson number one. You've got to be secretive where you pray. If you really want to connect with God, I mean really connect with God, you've got to be secretive where you pray. So again, amazing. Jesus doesn't begin with telling us what to pray. He said, let me tell you where to pray and why to pray? I want to make sure he says you're praying in the proper place for the proper purpose and the proper reason. Now, let me just stop. I want you to understand something. You can pray anywhere. You can pray anytime. You can pray about anything. Now, I will warn you, how many of you play golf? Just curious or play at it or try to play. Every time I get on a golf course, I remember what Dr. Billy Graham said. He said, the only place God's never answered my prayer is on a golf course. Well, that is true. But at the same time, you really can pray anywhere. But Jesus says, there's a special place that you could pray where you can connect with God unlike any other place where you pray, where you can hear God better than anywhere else, where you can experience fellowship with God like any other location. Well, where is that? Well, before he tells us, he begins with this advice. He says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Jesus hated hypocrisy. For they, now watch this, they love to pray. We'll talk about that in a moment. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Now, Jesus immediately goes to his arch enemies, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. They were the ultra right wing, ultra conservative, fundamentalist, legalistic Pharisees. And here's where they always prayed. They never prayed in secret. They always prayed in public. As a matter of fact, they were really good at doing what they did and they knew exactly where to do it because there were two places they knew everybody would hear them pray. One would be on the street corner when, the, when traffic was real busy and the other time was in the synagogue because that's where everybody showed up. So what they would always hold their prayers back. They'd always wait till they could get the biggest crowd. And their timing was impeccable because every afternoon, sacrifices would be offered. Trumpets would blow. That would be the signal it was time to pray. So whenever they would blow the trumpet, wherever you are, were, whatever you were doing, you were supposed to drop everything that you were doing and you were expected to stop and pray. Well, again, the Pharisees loved the spotlight. They love standing on center stage. They realize, man, we want to strut our spiritual stuff. We want to showcase our spirituality. So they would time it perfectly. They knew exactly when that trumpet would blow. And when that trumpet would blow, they would either be standing on a street corner or they would be standing right in the middle of the synagogue. And when that trumpet would blow, man, they were off to the races. And they would pray loud enough so everybody 
could hear it. Now, let me just stop before you draw a conclusion I don't want you to draw. There is nothing wrong with praying in public. And there's nothing wrong with praying before other people. Jesus was not condemning public prayers. The Bible is full of public prayers. As a matter of fact, most correct prayers that you'll find in the Bible, most of them were prayed before people. Here's the problem. The problem is not that the Pharisees were praying in public. That's not the problem. The problem is why they were praying in public. Because when they prayed, now listen carefully, they were trying to impress the people. They were not trying to impress God. They wanted not, that when, when, when they prayed, they didn't want people to say, what a mighty God we have. They wanted people to say, man, I wish I could pray like you. You are such a dude. I mean, you are such a great guy. I just wish, I wish I could be close to God like you. That's why Jesus said, they love to pray. But it was not the prayer which they loved. It was not even the person they were praying to that they loved. You know what they loved? They loved the praise of other people. They loved the clap on the back. They loved the shake of the hand. They loved the genuflection. They loved the people saying, oh, what a great man of God you are. Prayer was the show. They were the star. That's the way they saw prayer. And they were more concerned that people would praise them praying to God than they were that the people would praise the God that they were praying to. I'm reminded of a story. I don't think I've told you this before. I love it. It's a, it was a young lawyer. He'd just gotten out of law school, decided he'd start his own practice. So he uh, opened up a brand new office. He was sitting behind a shiny new desk. He was waiting for his first client to walk through the door. Well, it wasn't long until he heard some footsteps coming down the, the hallway. And sure enough, the door opened. Well, he wanted to look like, you know, he was already a very busy, successful lawyer. So he pretended to be busy. And so as the man walked in, he just picked up the telephone. And, and he began to carry on this fake conversation. He said, yes, I'll, I'll have my secretary get back to you as soon as I can. You understand I've got a very heavy schedule. I've got my clients backed up. Uh, I, in fact, I've got more business than I know how to handle. I do appreciate your, appreciate your, you know, your call. He says, if you'll call me back tomorrow at four o'clock PM, I'll, I'll take a look at your case and I'll take it if I can, but understand I do charge a lot. And I'm not sure I can do it. Hung up the phone, looked at the man who he was hoping would be his first client. And he said, uh, sir, uh, what may I do for you? And the man said, well, I'm, I'm from the telephone company. I come to hook up your telephone. <laughs> now, so often that's what we do. We wait till somebody's listening. Then we pick up the prayer phone like we're talking to God. So when it comes to your own prayer life, let me give you some good questions you might want to ask yourself wherever you pray and however you pray. These are just some suggested questions. Whose attention am I trying to get? Now, I, I'm not gonna call any names, but I've, I've, I've seen this in my ministry. It irritates me to no end. I have heard people, a lot of preachers, and particularly when they're around a bunch of preachers and they're called on to pray, and I know what they're doing about 12 minutes in, they're catching up on their prayer life. So I just ask you, whose attention are you trying to get? Second question is, who is it that I really want to hear my prayers? I don't understand why some people want other people to hear their prayers because the people they want to hear their prayers can't answer their prayers. I only care, I only care about one person to hear my prayer. That's the guy that can answer it. So who, who, who is it that I really want to hear my prayers? And, but this is the biggest question of all. Why am I praying to begin with? So let me just help you on one thing. If you ever go to God trying to get his will done, trying to get your will done instead of his will done, save your breath. You are wasting your time. But Jesus said, first of all, be secretive where you pray. Get in that secret place. Pray as long as you want to, but do it in private. Here's the second thing Jesus said. He said, be sincere when you pray. Be secretive where you pray, but be sincere when you pray. Now, Jesus very clearly tells us how not to pray and what not to do, but then Jesus tells us where to pray and how to do it. So here's what Jesus said. But, this is a big important word here, when. That's big, we'll come back to that in a minute. 
when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is that little word, when. Not if, when. So Jesus just assumed that if you love him and you follow him and you know him and he rules your life, he just assumed you'll pray. Matter of fact, I was working on this message several weeks ago and I put my pen down, I got to thinking, you know, I, I really think there are two things that just amaze Jesus about the average Christian. I, I, think it, I think it blows his mind. I really do. I think there are two things about Jesus that just, it just astounds him. The fact on the one hand that the average believer rarely talks to God. And even more, the average believer rarely talks about God. And I've come to believe in my own heart, the reason why most Christians don't talk much about God is because they don't talk much to God. Because let me tell you what I've learned in my own Christian walk with the Lord. When I'm really hitting on all eight cylinders and I'm reading my Bible and I'm journaling and I'm just taking time to put everything down, turn the cell phone off, forget the computer, and I just talk to the Lord, and I pray to the Lord, and I thank the Lord, and I praise the Lord, and I bless the Lord. Far before I ask for anything else, when I really have a fantastic time with the Lord, you know what I want to do? I want to go tell somebody about the Lord I just talked to. There's something about when you talk to the Lord, then you want to talk about the Lord. So notice that he says, when you pray, then he says this. All right, now when you pray, here's how you start. You pray to our Father. You're not only praying to the Father, you're praying to your Father. You're praying to our Father. So what else is Jesus assuming? Well, Jesus is assuming, number one, that you do pray. But he's also assuming, by the way, that when you pray, you are a follower of God. You really do know God. He just assumes, okay, you are a part of the family of God. You really are a child and you're really talking to the heavenly father. You know, I believe there are some people who struggle with their prayer life and, and, and they even struggle to pray at all. And if that's, if that's you, let me just tell you a question you ought to ask yourself and be honest. Is God really my father? Because prayer is a distinctly Christian privilege. When you pray, you're to pray as a part of God's family. And I'm really convinced that some people pray not as believers, not as Jesus followers. They pray as church members. They pray as church attenders. They pray as religious people. They're just praying to the God of the universe, but they're not really praying to their heavenly father. So that reads another question that you ought to ask. Have I really been born into the family of God? Have I really been born again? There's two, kind, there's two births. First birth, second birth. Physical birth, spiritual birth. Born, born again. Have you really been born again? Can you really call God your heavenly father? Because it's just natural that the child will pray to the father. But Jesus definitively tells us the best place for the child to pray to that father is in secret alone when nobody but the father is listening. So let me just say something as plain as I can. There's just no spiritual there is no emotional, there is no mental substitute for spending time alone with God. There's no substitute for it. I told you that you know, this past Wednesday, uh, Teresa and I celebrated our 48th anniversary and we were out, we were out, he took her to a real nice restaurant. In fact, I had to buy, uh, but, but I took her out to a real nice restaurant. And we, 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 when, we, when we got to the restaurant, I let them know it was our anniversary. And I said, look, we'd like to kind of have a, a private table, which they, 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 they gave us one. And it hit me that one of the reasons why people ask me, well, how have you been married 48 years? And, you know, you get up and talk about how much you love her, which I'm, I'm crazy about her. And you love her more today than the day you got married. I told her that this morning before I walked out of the house. She said, man, how does that happen? Well, one of the reasons why we have such a fantastic marriage is because we have such a strong, wonderful intimacy in our marriage. I don't mean just the sexual part. I mean, we just love hanging out with each other. We love being alone with each other. We love spending time alone. I, I told her day before yesterday, I said, you know, not just being married to the most beautiful woman I've ever seen, but good grief, I'm married to my best friend. 
What a, what a joy to be married to the best friend you have in the world. And we just love spending time alone. We just love hanging out together. And let me tell you what I've learned about that. Listen to me. Privacy fosters sincerity. When Teresa knows you'd rather spend time with me than anybody else in the world, she, when she really knows that, when she believes that, when I show that to her, you talk about strengthening our bond and strengthening our marriage. See, when you get alone with God, when you just shut the door, nobody's listening, nobody's looking, you shut that door and you just get alone with God in that secret place. You know what you're telling God? I'm serious about this. I'm sincere about this. You're more important to me than that cell phone. You're more important to me than that iPad. You're more important to me than that iMac. You're more important to me than my to-do list. You're more important to me than that client. You're more important to me than that sale I'm trying to make. I'm sincere, Lord. I am serious about this. And just as you want, listen to me, when you pray, you want God's full attention. Am I right? You want God's full attention. Well, then give him your full attention. He deserves your full attention just as much as you want his. So when you, when you get alone and you say, okay, I'm in that secret place. Let me tell you what that means. When you're in the secret place, that means there's no applause. Nobody's clapping going, what a great prayer you just prayed. There's no acclaim. Nobody's telling you what a great Christian you are. There's no awards. You're not getting a plaque or a gold watch when you pray. When you're in that secret place, it's just you and God. Not you and God and your wife, not you and God and your friend, not you and God. It's just you and God. And that's what God wants more than anything else, just you and him. And let me tell you what happens. When you get in that secret place and you get alone with God, nobody's looking, nobody's listening, nobody's, nobody even cares what you're saying. Nobody even knows what you're doing. When you get in that secret place, you bring two things immediately under control that usually control us when you go to that secret place. First of all, let me tell you the first thing you bring under control. You bring the clock under control. Because what you're saying to God is, I just want you to know right now in this moment, nothing's more important to me, not even my own life. Nothing's more important to me than spending time with you, just being alone with you, just talking to you, just praising you, just thanking you, just loving you, just fellowship with you. Nothing's more important. You bring the clock under your control. Second thing you bring under control is you bring the calendar under control because you're saying to God, I don't know what all I've got to do today. I don't care what I've got to do today. Just for the record, nothing I do today Nothing I do tomorrow, nothing I'll do any other day will be more important than spending time with you. That's why Jesus said, you really want to pray? Do you really want to pray in such a way you know God will hear you? And do you really want to pray in such a way that prayer will excite you? You'll be motivated to pray. You'll want to pray. It won't be a duty. It will be a delight. He said, number one, be secretive where you pray. Get alone. Number two, be sincere. Don't have an iPad in one hand and a prayer list in the other. Don't be praying to God while you're doing your email. Be sincere when you pray. And then here's the third thing, we'll be finished. He said, be specific in what you pray. Be specific. Now Jesus goes a step further and tells us not only where to pray and what to pray. He says, before I do that, let me tell you what not to pray. Let me tell you how not to do it. Now watch this. Boy, Jesus gets so deep. And when you pray, there he goes again, when you pray, says that second time. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Now, I want you to notice this word heard, because this is why I love the Greek language. Sometimes you can't really put into English what one word in Greek says. That word for heard doesn't just mean to hear. It just doesn't mean that the, that the sound has come into your ear and the brain has registered to your mind that that something was just said. That's not what that word means. The word there heard is a much deeper word. It literally means to be taken seriously. So what Jesus said was this. They think they're gonna be taken seriously because of their many words. And here's what Jesus is telling us. Do you really want God to take you seriously when you pray? 
I mean, do you really want to pray in such a way that God can sense and God knows, okay, you're worth my time right now. You're worth my attention right now. You are really sincere about this. You really want something. You really need something. And you really want to connect with me. I want you to remember this. God is not impressed with the length of your prayers. He's impressed with the depth of your prayers. Not the length. It's not how long you pray. It's how deep you go. That's what impresses God. Now, frankly, I'm guilty of what I'm about to tell you. So I just want you to know I'm in the same boat you are. How many times, let's just all be honest today right now. Let's be honest. How many times have you prayed and it's almost like you just pulled one out of the filing system, right? So let me give you an example. So you'll be at a restaurant and somebody will say, um, hey, would you say the blade? Would you bless the food? Okay. Yeah, I'll bless the food. And you just, and here's what you'll say. Lord, bless this food to the nurse of our bodies and our bodies to your service. In Jesus' name, amen. It's just prayer number 608. We've all done it. You're already thinking about, man, I can't wait to eat those oysters. I can't wait to get that steak. But Lord, by the way, and I wonder how many times, listen to me carefully. I wonder how many times, even in a blessing, you didn't pray a prayer. You just said a prayer. You, you, really weren't, you, really were, you really weren't thinking about the one you were praying to and what you were saying. You just wanted, okay, I said the prayer. You didn't put any heart into it. You didn't put any thought into it. It's just what you say. You know, I, I got to thinking, you could pretty much sum up a lot of the way people, people pray, really too, in words like this. This is the way the average Christian will pray, and this will be the only prayer they'll pray all day. Ready? God, thank you for your blessings. Please continue to bless me. If you'll continue to bless me, I'll continue to thank you for your blessings. Amen. <laughs> now, am I right or wrong? I love what that man said in the bumper. God hears desperate prayer. Desperate prayer. Then here's another problem. We think, well, but if we don't pray a certain length of time, then somehow it doesn't make it to heaven. It's like, well, if I only pray 60 words, it'll get to Mars, but if I pray 200, it'll get to Venus. And I just want you to understand something. You don't need to take a long time to tell God what you want or what you need. Can I, can I help you on something about praying? Most of us would be better off if we spent a lot more time just praising God and thanking God than asking God for give us something, telling God what we want. Because I love, it's such, there's such a freedom when you know, because listen, have you ever said, gosh, I meant to pray about that and forgot it. That's okay. Do you think God's going, I thought there was something else he needed to tell me. <laughs> he already knows what you're going to say. He knows what you need. Matter of fact, can I tell you how great God is? You need things you don't even know that you need. That's why Jeremiah 33, 3, God says, call unto me and I will answer you. Then he says, this, I will show you great and mighty things you don't even know. So God knows what you need. God already knows. He knows what's on that list. So he says, look, look, do not be like them. Do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, let me just stop right there. I've had people say this. Some people think, gosh, that's kind of demoralizing. I mean, that's kind of demotivating. I mean, it's kind of like <laughs> telling your kid, Daddy, can I go sit in Santa Claus's lap? Nah, he already knows what you need. You don't do that, right? He does know what you need. If, he's, if, if, if they tell the truth about Santa Claus, he knows what you need. But you take your kid anyway, right? So some people say, well, if he already knows what I need, why do I go? Well, you're about to learn something, I hope, because this is the point Jesus is making, and I'm going to say it again. God is not concerned as much with the length of your prayers as he is with the depth of your prayers. Here's what God is saying. Look, when you come into my presence, I don't mind you asking me. I don't mind. In fact, I want you to. Bring your needs to me. No big's too big. No, no needs too small. Anything you need, you come to me. I just want you to know you don't need to dwell on your shopping list. It's okay to tell me what it is, but I already know what's on it. Here's what God is saying when you come into his presence. Can I tell you what I want from you? I just want your heart. I just want your love. I just want your affection. 
I just want your praise. I just want your fellowship. I just want your undivided attention. Because I want to say something now in a different way, maybe you'll get it. Prayer is not primarily about getting things from God. It's about spending time with God. That's what prayer is all about. Not how long, but how deep. Death, not length. That's the winning formula. Because I want you just to imagine me. Just, you know, just, just think about this. What if you had a, a child? Or, or if you're a grandparent, you'll learn this. Grandchildren. And the only time they ever came into your room are the only time they ever picked up the phone and called you is because they wanted something. Just think about that. What gives me a thrill is sometimes when one of my grandkids will call me. And they either, you know, it's not they don't want anything. They want to tell me about something that happened at school or uh, Connor sometimes wants to call and just play a video game. He wants to get on, he's a, he's a computer whiz bang. He wants to play a game. That's my youngest grandson. He wants to play. He just wants to spend time with his pop. And sometimes they'll come and say, hey, Pop, just want you to know I love you. I mean, that's what it's all about. That's what it matters. That's what matters. It's not the length. It's the depth. It's the motive. That's what matters. So let me give you a history lesson. We'll finish. When the Gettysburg Battleground became a national cemetery, two men were asked to speak. Senator Edward Everett, he was a senator, was, was asked to give the main speech, the dedication speech. President Lincoln was asked, quote, just say a few appropriate words. So Everett, who is known as, by the way, one of the most eloquent speakers in the country, buddy, he delivered in style. You ready for this? He spoke like an angel. He talked for an hour and 57 minutes. He spoke 13,607 words. The crowd was spellbound. When he finished and went to take his seat, they gave him a standing ovation. Then President Lincoln stood to his feet, slipped on his steel glasses, walked to the podium, gave what is known today as the Gettysburg Address. 272 words in two minutes. But his words were so stunning. They were so poignant. They were so prophetic. When he went to sit down, he didn't get a standing ovation. Nobody clapped. But they sat there in stunned silence realizing, we have never, never heard anything like we, what we just heard in our life. And it changed an entire nation. I took an elocution class when I was in high school, not an electrocution class, an elocution class. And it was all about public speaking. So we had to memorize a speech. Well, I memorized the Gettysburg Address. And I remember the day before I was to give it, the day I was going to give it, I got up early that morning, I went in front of a mirror and I stood there and I, by memory, gave those words. And they began to resonate with me and I began to realize how powerful, how poignant, how pungent, how pointed, how purposeful, that moved an entire nation. 272 words in two minutes. Earth-moving, life-changing words. Why? It wasn't the length. It was the depth. To this day, nobody remembers what Everett said at all. Not a word. But to this day, people still read, people still revere the Gettysburg Address. So, so ends the course of prayer 101. Next week, we'll go to prayer 201. But I want you to leave you with this thought. The next time you go to pray, just remember, you're praying to a God that, who so loved this world, he sent his only son to die for our sins and brought him back from the grave. And one of the reasons why he did was so that through him, by faith in him, we could always connect to God. So let me just tell you how powerful prayer is and it will be done. If you're going to heaven, it's because you know Jesus. And if you know Jesus, it is because somewhere, some way, somehow, at some time, you prayed. You prayed 
My life was changed as a nine-year-old boy. When I didn't say a prayer, I prayed a prayer. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. You're that savior. Would you save this nine-year-old boy in Gainesville, Georgia? Would you just save me today? And just that prayer, it wasn't long, but Miss Sisk, it was deep. It was life-changing. It was a 180-degree turn. That is the power of prayer, which is why I agree with John Bunyan who said this, you can do more than pray after you pray, but you cannot do more than pray until you pray. And all of God's people said loud, amen. amen. Let's pray. With his bowed, with eyes closed. There's a God who hears prayer. He hears your prayer. If you will, first of all, pray the most important prayer you must pray before you can ever really pray. And that is the prayer of salvation. And I wonder who's listening to me right now by television. Who's listening to me right now on a computer? Who's in this room right now? You've never really prayed to receive Jesus into your heart. Maybe you said a prayer back in who knows when, but your life wasn't changed. You know why? Because you, you didn't pray a prayer, you, you, you said a prayer. But I wonder who today would say, I want to be on praying ground. I want to be able to talk to my God as my heavenly father. And I cannot do that until I come to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I want to make him my Lord and Savior today. If that's you right now, why don't you pray this prayer in your heart? Pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm separated from you because of my sin. And there's nothing I can do to take my sin away, nothing. But I believe you died for my sins. I believe God raised you from the dead. I believe you're alive right now. Come into my heart, save me, forgive me of all of my sins. I repent and turn away from my sins. I give all that I am to all that you are. Did you pray that prayer? Not say, did you pray that? Yes, pastor, I prayed that prayer. All right, then pray the rest of it. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Thank you for saving me today. And now, Lord, I pray, guide me in the next things I need to do and give me the strength to obey you for the rest of my life. Father, I want to thank you for the power of prayer. I want to thank you how a 90-second prayer in a theater changed my life. And I want to thank you that you do answer prayer. So, Father, keep your good hand on us as we close this service with a song that will honor you. May we remember that we're singing to a God who hears prayer. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand to our feet together. We've got one last song we're going to sing. Hey, remember to pick up the peeps, okay? Before you leave, invite someone and pray for them, and we'll be dismissed. <laughs>